Hello, everyone. Thank you. I think it's interesting that there was a Scott who did a great presentation for us with that, uh, those models from Accenture, and uh, a Scott who will be teaching the course that's coming up here as well. And uh, Great Scott. You know where I'm going with this, right? Um, so what I'm curious about and um, what I want to give you a sense of is how do you frame up insights discovery and how does it fit into what we're talking about and how does it fit up uh, with what you do relative to change management. So the way that I'd like to gauge that for you is how many of you are involved in either driving, managing, supporting, or consulting with change initiatives in some way? That's everybody, right? How many of those initiatives involve human beings? How many of those human beings have a need to communicate with each other? And at the same time, you have a need to communicate better with them as you're leading them through that change. That's, that's the place that discovery holds for me. Um, so what I want to do is take you through it, right? A very condensed mini version of what typically is delivered kind of to Scott's point in a four, six, even eight hour workshop. So very condensed notion of what you did. All of you that had a chance to get online prior to this meeting should have picked up your discovery profiles as you came in. How many of you have that, by the way? How many here have a profile? Great. And if you don't, no panic. The, the code to still receive it will be up for, I'll say, two more days. You can still get it. It'll be emailed to you. You'll still be able to maintain and understand a lot of the content. Uh, and if it's helpful, in fact, I'll even take the uh, uh, slides and, and send those back through the organization to give you access as well. So don't worry about capturing notes and grabbing what you need to. Feel free to jump in, ask me questions. It's going to move pretty fast, but it's also going to be very interactive and give some of you a chance to, while learning things about yourself, meet and make better connections with some of the folks that are here. So what I'm using is an instrument called Discovery. I don't own the intellectual property within the Discovery instrument, but I began using it back in 1999. Prior to using that assessment, I used DISC, Inkscape DISC, everything DISC at the time. I used Predictive Index as another model to understand human behavior and um, communications. What I want to get a sense of is, uh, and even Myers-Briggs as well, by the way, MBTI, I, I became certified to teach Myers-Briggs. Um, it was a class rather than a certification for DISC. How many of you use Myers-Briggs or DISC assessments in some of the work that you do? Um, the two most common instruments in the world, there's only one MBTI, one Myers-Briggs. There's literally thousands of DISC assessments and DISC instruments. Nobody owns the intellectual property labeled DISC. It was released to the public domain in the 40s. There's a great company in town that has an, organ, uh, has an organization, has an instrument called Everything Disc. That's the evolution of what used to be Inkscape Disc. There's some good organizations like that that have valid, reliable assessments and instrumentation. There's thousands, however, that don't um, within that disc world. So if that's the world you're in, just make sure that you check and you're cautious and you do your homework. I only have three documents on your tables. One of them is a very brief summary of the overview of validity and reliability for insights discovery. I think as practitioners especially, it's important that you have that. It's the eight and a half by 11 sheet, um, which on the top is titled Discovery, and it says validating the system. Insights is a uniquely owned intellectual property by the company in Scotland. I'm one of their roughly 5,000 resellers in the world. Um, there's also the opportunity for some of you maybe within the work that you do to become accredited, use the instrument in your own work, or team up with our firm as well and, and do that work. But what I want to do is take you through it, giving you a sense that it works in every type of organization at every level. Um, I've spent a lot of time taking CEOs through this program um, and had the chance to do that all over the world as well. And those are a lot of folks, as you can imagine, like some of you in the room, that both know a lot and also know that they know a lot. So tough group to start with, to take them through something which is just personality assessment. Your first reaction is, I've been through that a thousand times. The power of discovery, which is unique, I think, of instruments in the world, the power of the instrument is the ability to take action and use it every day. Those of you that use DISC and Myers-Briggs, almost every hand went up. Hold your hands up again if you've been through those systems and, and you remember your, your designation within that model. Keep your hand up if you know the designation of the people who you work with most frequently on a daily basis, whether it's two, three, four, five, six people, you know their designations as well. Keep your hand up if you behave differently because in the moment you recognize that you're an ENTJ and they're an ISTP and that means you should do something differently. And if someone was watching you, they would say, hey, I see that you behave differently right there in that moment. And if, you, if the answer is still yes, that's great. For most people, it's not. What if you had an assessment that was in an organization that everybody could use and you could actually see people using it constantly, literally, right, in every interaction, and you watched it become part of their language 
And that's what I saw in 1999 when I saw this system, I brought it into my company. We only had 60 people, but within a couple of weeks, everybody in the organization was using it actively and you could watch them use it. You, could, you, you, you recognize when it became part of the language, which is what it does. Um, so what, it, what it's predicated on is this understanding of self. Who are you? How are you wired? What makes you tick? Because you're the standard by which you judge everyone else. So in terms of communication, if you're a fast talker and you like to work like this and you're always in go mode, you always wonder why people around you don't move as quickly. You always wonder why they're so slow. What you're really wondering is they're broken, so how can you fix them? <laughs> and human nature being what it is, how do you fix somebody? If you're a real fast talker and a fast mover and they like to reflect and talk like this, what do you tend to do? You know what you do, how do you fix them? Speed up, speed up, talk faster, right? We, we do more of what's causing the problem for us in the first place, which is the big mistake that everybody makes. Where really, if we wanted to create an effective communication with them, we'd first have to know who we are, what's our style, because that's where we're coming from. We'd have to look at what Carl Jung called the otherness of the other and recognize that they're unique, they're different from us. How are they different? And then we'd actually have to know what to do. That's the role that Discovery played. So my life with Discovery, while using Myers-Briggs and DISC assessments in the organization, was as a customer for three years. Watched it take over the business, fell in love with it, and I've been doing this work since 2003, and um, it's been a lot of fun taking me all over the world. But even in that period of time, I've still redefined somewhat answering this question, who am I? So I'd like you to answer the question, just talking to the folks at your table, and as, as quickly as you can, answer the question by describing yourself with just one adjective. But I want the adjective to be alliterative. So my name is Scott. I'm standing up here right now. I'm going to be standing Scott. Pretty tricky, right? It's not a hard assignment. I could be smiling Scott, speaking Scott. You could be tired Tom, frustrated Frank, new member Ned. Whatever it is, just come up with something quickly and share it at your table or a table right next to you. Go ahead. Some of you came up with a, with a descriptor right now, and it actually fits you very well maps to your personality, reflects well who you are, how you think you show up, how you're wired, meaning the, the persona, the conscious persona that you would bring to the workplace. What's also interesting about that is some of you kind of stumbled on one and as soon as you said it, you wanted to pull it back and go, hmm, that's not, that's not a good one, that's not really me. Because what you did in that moment is create consciousness about how you are describing yourself. Daniel Hahnemann wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow, System 1 and 2. System 1 is anything you can do automatically that you don't even have to think about. Set everything down that you're holding, just for a second, so your hands are free. Free up your hands and don't clock each other, but just fold your arms. Okay, that's system one. Nobody had to think about which finger goes where and the crotch of which arm and how do my arms come together. System one, no brainer. Fold your arms the other way. I'll wait. I'm genuinely still waiting. See, that's system two. System two is harder for us. It's the more complex thinking that our brain has to do. For you to manage change and people going through change, you have to switch your brain to system two. You have to elevate the way in which you perceive others so that you can treat them differently. You can't rely on patterns that you've always relied on because sometimes they're wrong. And that's when they get you in trouble. When I came in here, there was a gentleman, I can't see his name from here, but he looks just like my brother-in-law, okay? Just like my brother-in-law, but I hate my brother-in-law. So my first system one reaction might be, hey, he and I are not gonna get along, right? And I'll communicate through my tone of voice and my body language that things aren't clicking for us. But if I don't move to system two and say, wait a minute, I don't know this guy. Looks like my brother-in-law, but it's not him. System two allows me to make a different decision about how I would interact with him. So I want you to mentally keep your mindset on moving from what's automatic and you do it every day and it's been repeatable and it's a pattern of communication and it may or may not be serving you well to move to system two, which is to say, who is this person? How are they wired? How do they gather information? How do they make decisions? And how can I interact with them best? That's what discovery enables you to do. So I want to just also give you it's a mini personality assessment because discovery is about who are you and how are you wired and what makes you tick. I want you to think about when you first became self-aware today. For a lot of us, it's looking in the mirror. You look in the mirror for the first time and you have an idea of who you are and how you're likely going to show up for the day. Now, in my example here, this kitten has maybe a misinformed idea of how it will be perceived throughout the day. But if that's you, you've got an expectation of how people see you and it might be completely wrong. As we get into your profiles, you're going to recognize there's a way you know yourselves to be 
And another way that you show up when you're unaware of your own behavior operating out of that system one, and we're going to show you both. For some of you, they're similar. For some of you, those two sides of how you show up are going to very, be very different. Just out of curiosity in the room, as a metaphor, which, which of these two animals do you align with better? Which one's more like you? I want to know where my kittens and my lions are in the room. So who, who, who believes that they're more aligned with the kitten? Raise your hand. Where's my kittens in the room? Really? Wow. This is a more significant skewing than I'm used to seeing. Uh, the rest of you lions, is that a safe bet? Lions in the room? Boom, look at how you voted. Kittens always vote like this. <laughs> right? It's just, just a function of personality. You could, well, you can, but I didn't give you that third option. Some of you perceive yourselves to be both. The point is, we don't even know what you're using as your criteria to come up with that decision, which is how we work with each other all the time. We get to the conclusion, we hear the conclusion, but we don't understand the methodology, though, the way in which a person gathered information to be able to make a decision. And that's the only way that we can truly understand how to work better with somebody else. Some of you said, kitten, I love kittens, I'm a kitten. And some of you said, lions, God, I'm scared of lions, kitten. Right? Personality is about not just where you end up in your decision making, but how you got there. And, and discovery in our model informs how you can get there. So I want to give you a sense of that. It's very simple. Um, there's a card, a half sheet card on the table in front of each one of you. Pick that up and take a look at it and give some thought for yourself to where do you fall within this model. Take a look at the side of it that looks like my slide here. I just want you to think about which of these energies, we call these color energies, which of these do you lead with? And a point of clarity, you won't become a red person or a blue person or a green person. We do not identify people by color. We talk about people using color energies. So I want you to think about which of these color energies is most natural for you to use. Is it determined, competitive, demanding, fiery red? You're all about task. You're all about getting stuff done. You're always in go mode. The shortcut for fiery red is do it now, do it now, do it now. That just kind of resonates with you really, really well. My wife leads with high fiery red, and for 27 years when I'm driving the car and the light turns green, she says go. <laughs> Short, sweet, go, turn, go, left, go, every time. Makes me crazy, but it's the way she's wired. She can't help herself, okay? So in an extroverted way, talking to me, she's about get the job done. That's what fiery red is. If it's you and you have high fiery red, you're, you're in an extroverted way getting things done. If you're more extroverted, but you're less about task and more about people, that's our yellow energy. Sunshine yellow energy is energetic, enthusiastic, optimistic, outgoing, karaoke, happy hour, energy, enthusiasm. You can't wait for me to stop speaking. Actually, you wish you were up here speaking, but as soon as I'm done, you can meet everybody and talk to everybody and trade cards and make connections. The energy of people gets you out of bed in the morning. The shortcut for sunshine yellow is do it together. So now you've got extroverted fiery red focused on the data and extroverted energetic sunshine yellow focused on the people. The flip side of our model, some of you might align yourselves more with, introverted thinking, analytical, cool blue, cautious, precise, deliberate, questioning, formal. You've already started to pour through that validity document that I pointed out to you on the table. You've also looked at all the material on the table. You've made sure that you have your own set. So you've already sorted all the stuff. You have three. You don't like the messiness of the wristbands? That's cool blue. Cool blue is, in a quiet way, providing logic and structure based on data, facts, right? The shortcut is do it right. Is that the energy? And in fact, it's harder for you to make the commitment to my question because you want more time to assess. You want more data. You want more detail. But you'll make your decision quietly. The last one is earth green, amiable, patient, caring, relaxed. It's taking in information, but it's based on people, feelings, and relationships. So you're still quiet, still talk with a calmer, slower tone of voice, but your focus for decision-making is not on the data and the facts. It's on the people, based on feelings, and based on relationships. So if you, if you listen to how I described them, the shortcut for Earth Green, by the way, is do it harmoniously. What you start to recognize, and Jung had a theory called bipolar dynamism, which is the theory of opposite personalities. In our model, someone who leads with fiery red is the opposite of someone who leads with earth green. Right across the model. The opposite of sunshine yellow is cool blue. Now what's interesting about our opposite types, if we interact with them out of system one without awareness, they tend to bug us. They tend to bug us. They bring gifts that we don't typically have. They operate in a way that could benefit us if we would partner with them. But if we're just operating out of system one, they sometimes bug us. We want to talk loud with energy and enthusiasm. They want time for silence and reflection on the data. You start to see where teams just get absolutely dysfunctional. And ironically, 
many times with no awareness of why it's happening. Put yourself just mentally right now in one of the quadrants, the energy that you lead with. Plunk yourself in there. Now I want you to plunk a spouse or partner in their leading quadrant. Your spouse or partner. <laughs> Think about it for a second, remembering that red and yellow are extroverted, blue and green are introverted. Red and blue make data-based decisions, and yellow and green make people-based decisions. How many of you married your opposite types? Over half of you. What were you thinking? <laughs> Opposites attract. They literally are drawn to each other. And then you call it love, and you get married, and you want to kill them for about 40 years because you're, you're, you're communicating differently on every level. You're gathering information differently. And yet, if you're aware, there's gifts that you bring to each other, and that's what we want you to know. The other thing about opposite types that many people don't know is there's an overuse of these energies. My wife thinks she's being determined, strong-willed, and purposeful when she says, go. I think she's overusing her earth green or fiery red energy, and instead I think she's being aggressive, controlling, driving, overbearing, and intolerant. Now, it's maybe an extreme version of just that little activity, but it's my perception of her energy being overused. So you may come into work delivering all of your gifts, the gifts of personality through these color energies, as we call them, without realizing that you're interacting with your opposite type, and they see you on this slide. Too much sunshine yellow, excitable, frantic, indiscreet, flamboyant, hasty. Too much cool blue, stuffy, indecisive, suspicious, cold, reserved, analysis, paralysis. Come on, make a decision. If you lead with yellow energy, you're trying to make a fast decision and move forward. You don't care about all the detail. You start to see the disconnect that people have. And they think it's about the issue they're discussing. It's not the issue you're discussing. It's the style you are using to discuss the issue. Even wonderful, amiable, caring, earth green. We like to say um, unconditional love sits in that middle of that earth green quadrant. But if you push somebody's earth green energy too far, the expression is hell hath no fury like earth green energy scorned, right? Push them too far and they snap. If you've got high earth green energy, you know that. You'll give people a lot of room. You know, fool me once, fool me twice, fool me. Okay, wait a minute. Now I'm digging my heels in. Now it's go time. I want you to just be aware of the dynamic of your own energies, the blend that you have, and then also recognize that you can overuse whatever it is that you lead with. In our discovery model, you can also lead with two energies, equally high, equally the same. You can also lead with two opposite energies. 9% of our profiles, with over 2 million samples that we've taken in, 9% of people lead with two opposite energies, first and second. That type of person, that, that combination, doesn't exist in MBTI, which is very interesting if you think about it. That assessment's gonna move you one place to the other. A lot of you are not in your heads like you're somewhat aware of that. It's just an interesting concept because when we built the model, we didn't think that would happen either, but it did. The data quickly confirmed that somebody sees in themselves a lot of determined, driven, fiery red, and guess what? A lot of amiable, patient, caring, earth green, first and second, and they float between the two. Young talked about those people as having almost a creative tension and how they show up and how their personalities are wired. So good day, bad day. I want you to think about the color energy that you lead with. And I've got some bracelets in the middle of the table. Big ones, small ones. If you want to get creative, you could put one color energy as a large band and then what you think you lead with as a second color energy, maybe a small one. So I lead with yellow. I love, I'm full of energy and enthusiasm, followed by fiery red, get stuff done. I wish I had a t-shirt that would just say, have fun, get it done, because that is my wiring in any role that I play. Think about what your wiring is. If you want to jump ahead to the profile, it's the very last page in the profile to give you guidance as you think about what's the blend of color energies that you lead with. On the very last page, there's some bar graphs. The bar graph on the left represents your highest color energies. The bar graph on your left. If you don't have the profile, you should be able to guess off that card that you're looking at or off the slide that I showed you. What are the energies that you lead most with? If you have an equal amount of red and yellow, grab two of the exact same size bracelets, red and yellow. If you think you've got three energies and you just cannot differentiate between those two, or those three rather, that's why some of the wristbands are smaller, put on three of those small wristbands. The message that you're communicating both to yourself and to others is this is my wiring. Take a minute and grab those, and then go to the last page in your profile. I want to take you through an understanding of the graphs and what they mean. Let me have you take a few minutes now, right? Just as we're sort of soaking ourselves into this model of what we, what we call color energies, it's the simple side of insights discovery, the simple side of Jungian psychology that makes it so transferable within a business, within helping people communicate quickly and easily. The profile that most of you have is unique to you, one in a hundred billion. 
One in a hundred billion is the uniqueness of your profile. Now what happens, because I mentioned profile, and some of you have started to look at them and reference them, is you're not even hearing me speak anymore. So what we have to be careful we do is there's concepts that I'll show you and teach you and then point you back into the profile to give you a chance to share. Those of you that are extroverts, you're dying to show people your, pro your profile. Most of you are dying to go home and show your spouse your profile because it's your owner's manual. And if they would do what it says, everybody wins, right? That ain't going to happen. I'll tell you right now. Was that a question? Well, Blue Man was having me ask the question, how do you know it's one in a hundred billion? One in a hundred billion? It's the actual mathematical calculation based on the system that produces the report. So it's actually a tangible number. But you have no No, we know how many unique combinations can be pulled. So based on how you filled out the evaluator, that can lead to, that itself doesn't lead to 100 billion different combinations. But for each of those combinations, which is X, there's different profiles. So if we took your data and ran it again, the profile reads very differently. But it's off the exact same data. What, we're what we tried to do, the founders in Scotland tried to do, is create a system that was as, almost as unique as you are. Right? Nothing is as unique as you are, but, but in, in my 25 years in business, I've never seen anything come as close as this profile does. So what I'd like you to do is go back to the beginning of the profile. Those of you that have it, just take a few moments and read the overview. The overview is just two pages, but if you have a pen in your hand, I'd like you to grade it. Meaning, if you disagree with something you're reading, you don't think it's you, it doesn't resonate with you, just put a little check by it. So read through the overview, two pages, and again, those of you that didn't have a chance to do it, you still will in the next day or two if you'd like to. Let me ask you this. Uh, keep reading if you're not done, but just to keep it going in the time that we have, I want to get some feedback on the validity for most of you. So there's about 50 sentences in there. Each sentence you checked would be about 2% wrong. How many sentences did you check that you, you don't think describe you well? None, zero, two. Let me hear them. Two, three, two, one, five. Oh. Two. That's funny, you said two. How about just give me a description as you read through it? What did you think? What did you notice? How did you feel? Accurate? Mine was closed. Some of it was just language. And then when I thought, well, what does that word mean? It's, then you're just comparing language. And I, that doesn't count. Yep. So in general. In, in general. Good. Okay. The reason I ask that, and, it's, and it doesn't work in the context of a group that's not an intact team, but those of you that checked any sentence, what I want you to do when you have a chance is go validate that for yourselves with somebody who knows you well. I sat down a few years ago to lunch with a woman who said, it says I do this, I don't do this. And it says this is me, and this is not me. And it says I am nitpicky, and I am not nitpicky. And, and you could just see this awareness moment. And she said, oh my God, I am nitpicky. I'm all these things. You know, almost in a panic, and I said, I don't know, I just met you. But, but we do know, and in my experience, anecdotally, about 75% of what people check, other people validate. And it's one of the funnest experiences in a team when somebody says, all right, I'll read one. It says I do this, and I do this, and I do this. And the whole group goes, oh my gosh, you do that every single meeting we have, right? This is this, this idea of there's a way I show up when I'm unaware, there's a way I show up when I'm aware of my behavior, and for some of you, they're the same, similar. For some of you, they're very different. When do we start creating this thing I'm calling conscious persona? When do we start to create the mask that we put on, that we bring to the conscious work that we do every day? Do you know when you started? Brain scientists say four months of age. Not four years, four months. Babies start to manipulate us. Parents, any parents in here? You know the feeling, and it started when they were four months old. Babies react, they act a certain way based on your reaction, and they modify their behavior so that they know what they're going to get. We have friends whose son Mikey is 20, I guess he's 21 now, but he would get up in the crib and he'd shake it at night, and they had a two-way intercom, and if he was coughing, they would hear him, or choking rather, they'd hear it. And one of them would say, Mikey's choking, get in there. Right? And so not too, it didn't take very long for Mikey to key in on choking's a good buzzword. I love to be picked up. So Mikey would wake up, shake the crib, and say, I'm choking in here. Mikey's choking, 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 choking. What two and a half year old knows how to do that, right? All of them, all of them. Because it's how we build this conscious persona that says, what's the best way I can show up to drive results in whatever it is that I do? And it's a little more red, a little less green, a little more blue, a little more red and blue, a little more whatever the combination is based on the personality type of who we're born as, we modify it over time, lock it in through adolescence and say, this is the person I want to be when I go to work.
When you filled out our evaluator, this is the person you gave us. The person you wish you were, think you are, and believe others expect you to be. That's the psychological definition of conscious self. Let me show you how we got there, and it's take you to the very last page in the profile. Oh, I brought my family here too. Um, um, a different model of diversity. Color energies within one organization, our tiny organization of five. The reason I bring it up here is because it shows the way in which we do things reflects our color energies every time. My son, my family came into the office. My son leaned over the card that I've given all of you and he started to read it when he was nine. He read determined, competitive, demanding, strong-willed. He was reading out loud, unusually. And my youngest daughter, Scotty, said, Mom, you're red, so am I. And my friend Dave in the office heard that and he goes, okay, everyone, put the hats on. We used to bring hats to these trainings a lot. Put the hats on, we'll take a family picture. So immediately my daughter and wife put on red hats, which is take the shot, take the picture, right? We're here, we're ready, go, 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 do it now. Their fiery red energy came through. My, myself and my oldest daughter said, a picture, great idea. We'll go out in the parking lot and we'll jump in the air, we'll throw the hats in the air, we'll take a bunch of photos. We took all those photos. We have photos with hats in the air. Look at my daughter's hat in the photo. Sunshine yellow, one of the negatives is you might appear disorganized, like on purpose, on purpose she's appearing disorganized, which is that energy and enthusiasm and creativity. Four of us are lined up for this photo. My son's not in the picture yet. He's still leaning over the piece of paper and he's, he's analyzing it and he says, can I wear more than one hat? And my wife with her fiery red energy says what? No, no pick a hat. <laughs> I swear to you, she says, no, pick a hat. And I said, Connor, wear as many hats as you want, right? So he says, all right, well, I'm green, but I'm more blue. If you look close, he's got two hats on in that picture. What kid knows how to do that? What kid thinks that way? My son and your kids and you, if you lead with blue and green energy, do it right. The right solution, the right answer was two hats. The fiery red solution was pick a hat. Let's get her done. Yellow said, get this done so we can get outside and have some fun. The point I want to make is it shows up in everything you do. It showed up in the way all of you read your profile. Think about how you specifically read your overview. Fiery Red, you probably didn't even quite finish it. You didn't have to. Yeah, this is me. Yep, yep, yep. Man, this is pretty accurate. Yeah, good. I buy into it. <laughs> Done. Now what? And you're the first people to look at me. Sunshine Yellow, you started to talk to someone next to you even if you didn't know them. Because the way you process is verbally and you had to tell somebody. Right? What you didn't realize is they were quietly trying to read their own. If the two of you both lead with yellow and you read them side by side, it was great. Then you just happily shared everything and it still took you longer, right? I got a table. I know I have a poster child table for yellow energy back there. And if you, and if you led with blue, an interesting dynamic occurs because the gift of deeper understanding and critical thinking sits in blue energy. You didn't read it to sort of validate it all was accurate and correct for you. You went at it more to say, is this wrong? Is this wrong? Is this wrong? Is this wrong? It's, it's, it's the gift of critical thinking leads you to go at every instance differently than someone who leads with sunshine yellow that says, the first sentence is, is me, I bet all 49 are me, and I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> Just to see how opposite we are in this natural orientation we have towards how we gather information and how we show up. I just want to make it real, and I'll give you a couple more examples that makes it so real. It's based on the exact same discovery, it's based on the exact same psychology as is MBTI or Myers-Briggs. 25 years ago, our founder said, I think if we could make it um, simple and allow people to, to use it in practical application, it would get some legs underneath it in an organization and everybody would use it. And that's the simple side, that's the color energies. They said the depth of humans, right, is so much more than 16 types. Let's create 100 billion. They actually set out to create 100 million. And through the algorithms and the system that they built, 100 billion unique profiles. So the more time you spend reading yours, the more unique you will realize you are and, and the way that it describes you well. So the concepts are familiar to most of us because almost every hand went up um, when I asked about MBTI earlier. In 1921, Jung wrote a, boat, uh, um, wrote a book, coined the terms introversion and extroversion. He said you're either oriented towards what's out there or what's in here. You gather information through your, your, your five senses or leading with high sensation or your intuition, your gut feel. And then you make your decision based on data, facts, and logic, i.e. thinkers, or people, feelings, and relationships, i.e. feelers. Now, those of you that have a basis or a background in MBTI, you look at this and say, there's no J and P. Well, there is. Jung used the terms J and P. He said, J are judging functions, the decision-making judging functions, and they are thinking and feeling. 
That's how he used it. If you go back and read anything he wrote, that's what he said. He said um, the perceiving functions, the information gathering functions, that's sensing and intuition. So he used the terms, but he doesn't have a separate scale. There's no fourth scale. That's one of the key differences from discovery to MBTI. And yet there's still, it still allows for symmetry with the two models. If you're part of an organization or if you personally use Myers-Briggs, we can layer right on top of that. But we bring clarity and make, make the Jungian psychology actionable. And when you think about leading change and managing change, right, at times it's a firefight. You've got to be able to grab something that makes whatever communication system you're using actionable in the moment so that people can use it when they're under pressure by moving to system two. And that's one of the most difficult things to do. Absolutely challenging. So within that model, the top is thinking, like I said, for decision making, red and blue. The lower end of our model, green and yellow, is feeling based. The far right extroversion, left side introversion. That's the model itself. It's how we define the color energies and give them meaning. The reason cool blue means what it means is because we define it through introversion and thinking. Jung's attitudinal functions. Earth green is introverted feeling, sunshine yellow, extroverted feeling, and fiery red, extroverted thinking. So you can see where you might align fiery red with ESTJ, for instance, or earth green with INFP as an example. You see the symmetry in the models, but what I found in talking with someone about our model for five minutes, within six minutes, they'll say something to me about, look, this is me being fiery red, but we got to get something done. I had lunch with a woman just a year ago who'd been through many, many models and recently been through some others and I showed it to her and she said, well, okay, I, I totally get this, but I know this is fiery red of me right now, but like, why would I switch? And I said, why did you just switch? Right? You've told me you use other models. Why did you say fiery red? Because there's something about the definition and the colors and that side of the model that makes it so actionable that people grab onto it and use it. And that's what you want. When you're trying to move people through change, they've got to be aware of themselves, aware of others, and take different action with everybody else. And I've watched this work in my own company, and I've probably been in 500 companies since at least. Companies like Microsoft at the start that you saw have 51,000 people that have been through this program. I was just in New York last week taking a team from Google through it as well. They're already up to several thousand, and they there's a train the trainer model that, to be aware of as well. So Google had two little sessions with 20 people and sent 85 trainers to the train the trainer. They just said, this works. Wow, everybody should be using it. The point I want to make is um, think about like where for yourself, right? How much more actionable could you be as you interact with other people and have an awareness because through change comes stress. And if you're not paying attention, the stress changes your ability to be aware of the other person dramatically. Higher stress, less awareness. Really high stress, no awareness. And so what do you do? What does everybody do? Moves to the bad side of their color energies and tries to fix everybody else. That gets really, really difficult in an organization because now nobody's paying attention to anybody. The triggers, the color energies, right, give you a chance to make it work. So what I want to give you a sense of um, within the profile and the time that we have is how did we come up with this? How many of you enjoyed filling out the evaluator? Not many. How many of you thought it was just a total pain? Like you wanted to choose between two words and it was frustrating because you were one and not the other one and why would we dare make an assignment like that? We asked you one question 25 times. The exact same question, right? Interestingly enough, it's pretty simple. How much red, blue, green, and yellow energy do you perceive in yourselves? So if you look at one of the questions, this is number three. For most, someone said buoyant and lighthearted, they lead with what energy? They're most what? Buoyant and lighthearted. Sunshine yellow. Next, they're determined and dominant. What color? Fiery red. Uh, um, exact and precise. Cool blue and calm and even tempered. Earth green. That's all we asked you 25 times. We averaged your answers and we created uh, the conscious graph on the left. So on the last page in your profile, the left-hand graph, which is why we recommend that's the alignment of the bracelets you should probably choose because it's what you chose when you filled out the evaluator 25 times. Whatever energy is highest in that graph is the energy that you lead with. Let's do a survey. And by the way, if you don't have your profile, just guess. I want you to guess so that we can have the whole group participate in the mini survey. Who in the room leads with yellow energy? Look around, let's see what we've got. A lot of people that would enjoy coming to an after hours networking event to learn more, right? Some energy, some enthusiasm, some good food, and. Drinks? Beer. Beer? 
Did you say hear or beer? Don't know, <laughs> right? Holiday party. Um, who leads with red energy? Okay, smaller percentage, maybe a fourth. Who leads with earth green energy? All right. You see the interesting blend in the room? See the interesting mix? If you lead with cool blue right now, you're panicking that I would forget to survey you. <laughs> Aren't you? Gotcha. Gotcha. Cool blue? Yeah, I saw you. Your body language said, what? Wait, <laughs> what? This dummy missed us. I do that sometimes. If I miss cool blue at the end, it's an analytical mistake. If I miss earth green at the end, and then I come back and say, I'm sorry, and they go, oh, that's OK. That's, <laughs> right? There's that, that, that human element that makes me feel OK for my mistake. By the way, those of you with cool blue, you just, you didn't, I didn't get that warmth connection at the end. I just got, hey, you almost missed it there. So that's graph on the left. What you told us is the, the mask that you put on every day. You know when you put it on? Right when you move to consciousness. For a lot of us, you hit your alarm, you wake up, and boom, go to work. This is who I'm going to be. This is my job. This is the role that I play. What you don't realize is all day long, you slide back. You think about it and you go there again. System two, system one, conscious, less conscious, conscious, less conscious. You bounce back and forth between the two graphs constantly. And for some of you, you stretch a little. For some of you, you stretch a lot. The way that we know what it feels like if you stretch a lot is how you feel on Sunday night. What time does it hit you Sunday night? 4.30, 5 o'clock, right? during 60 minutes, there's a point at which you remember the next day is Monday and you physiologically have a reaction. You feel yourself moving to consciousness, meaning you ended your weekend Sunday night at five. Stop that, stop that, why would you do that? You don't need to move to consciousness Sunday night. You actually don't need to move to it Monday morning when you're coming to work. You don't need to be there getting dressed in the morning, having breakfast, seeing your family, getting in your car, driving to work. We want you to bring the right hand graph Whoops, the right hand graph to work because the only thing we want you to think about when you jump to persona is not this one you've created as you grew up and developed, but the person in front of you. What we want to say is bring your natural selves to the work that you do, coming in to manage a change initiative, and the first person you meet with leads with cool blue. Spike your cool blue. Get your ducks in a row. Slow down. Quit smiling so much. Some of you smiled at me as I said that, and as I said, don't smile so much. I could, your faces just went, hmm. Physiology is so amazingly descriptive if we start to pay attention to it. If we pay attention to it using system two, we don't even need to have ears. We don't need to listen to a word anybody says. Physiology tells us everything. But if you go down the hall and your next meeting is someone who leads with fiery red, stand up. Don't sit down. Have a stand up meeting. Get right to the point and get out of there. If you lead with earth green, you, went, you just went to yourself, oh, like that's so rude. No, it isn't. It's what someone who leads with fiery red energy loves. I only brought a few sets of these. But I want to give you a sense of, in the work that we do, everybody in the organization ends up with a set of these blocks. And they just stack them on their desk. So, of course, this one is a, a creative combination. Uh, and they're, they're nuclear wrapped. <laughs> Come on. It really is nuclear wrapped. I can't find it. We're going to use this combination. So somebody who leads with sunshine yellow, followed by blue. Come on. All right, here's an assignment for this table. Oh, All right, as soon as I gave up on it. So what you want to think about is if you're going to come in and interact with somebody, you not only work with them through that leading color energy, but it's always what's second. Jung always talked about a dominant and auxiliary attitudinal function, first and second. First is introverted thinking, right, followed by extroverted thinking. This person's way into what? Data, thinking, logic-based decisions. Don't come in there and say, tell me about your weekend, okay? <laughs> There's a time for it, but probably only when they go there first. In fact, don't ever just walk in on them either. Prepare yourself. Email them when you want to come. Schedule the meeting. Think about the kind of interaction that matters. This person, go in there all the time. Don't sit down. Don't sit down and start telling me about your weekend. I don't want to know. You, you start to see how we can be defined in a simple way, but yet it, it, it goes all the way down to this deep level of who we are at a psychological level based on the richness of the full psychology. But as human beings, we need a trigger. We need a, something directional to help us know how to treat somebody and which way to go. The, the, um, on your profiles, those of you that have it, the graph in the middle is an important one because that measures what you stretch when you stretch. So if I didn't define it for you before, the graph on the right is you in pajamas before you put your game face on. The graph on the left is you with that mask on doing the work that you do. The preference flow graph in the middle is powerful because you can control it right now. 
Starting now, literally, you can choose to spike up or allow to fall any color energy in that graph in the middle. It's like if I said, hey, would you bring more fiery red? You'd say, yeah, you bet I will right now. In that moment, speaking with that tone of voice, focused on task, if you will, you, you spiked your red energy up. If we could have measured you in that moment, you'd have a red spike up. Whatever you have spiked up in the graph in the middle, you're making an effort to bring more of. Those of you that have a big green spike in the middle, ultimately you should share that with a spouse because you're able to say, look, honey, I'm trying to show you that I care. That's what the green spike in the middle means. It doesn't mean you're necessarily delivering on that because you, if you're going from 5% to 15%, it's only 15%, but at least you can get some credit for trying. Big yellow spike in the middle says what? You're trying to be the life of the party. A big fiery red spike says you're trying to show everybody that you're that get things done person. But if you really think about what matters most in human communication, it's not all of us compensating for what we don't bring to the table naturally. Meaning your graph on the right, whatever the lowest energy is in the graph on the right, that's what most of you are spiking. For how many of you is that true? You're spiking the energy that you have the lowest amount of in the graph on the right. That's hard to do. My, my highest energy is yellow. My lowest is cool blue. That means I'd be coming into work every single day trying to be analytical, cautious, precise, and non-emotional. I can't even show you like a quick five second example of what that would look like. I can try. I wouldn't, I'd stop smiling. I'd take some body language out of the work that I've been doing and I'd say there's some good information here and it's validated on the forms in front of you. <sighs> like I'm bushed. And by the way, that's what happens to you. You're bushed all day long, spiking up whatever you're trying to do in the graph in the middle. And yet what you really should be doing is only spiking what you need when you need it. And it's almost always based on the person you are interacting with. They lead with red, spike your red, don't sit down. They lead with green, check in, find out how they're doing. If they lead with green and you lead with red, you know what you do? You walk in and say, hey, just checking in on the family. How's the family? What's your kid's name? Bob, Bill, Bob, uh, good. Who else? Anybody else? Anything else going on there? That's great. Listen, on this project that we're moving these people through, I need to know, right? And what does the person say to themselves? You don't care, you jerk. You're just trying to get a project update. Don't pretend you care about my family. Look at how many of you are nodding your heads to that. The hardest thing for someone with fiery red to do when they interact with earth green is not to accomplish anything. Because what you're actually accomplishing is the building of relationship and the building of rapport, right? You're putting money in the bank. And to do that with fiery red, you check in with how they're doing and you say, thanks, that's great to hear. And then you bite your tongue till it bleeds if you have to and you walk out. Because there's a part of you that says, I didn't move anything forward, but you did. You moved relationship forward. And that's what matters when you're paying attention to this stuff. So the graph in the middle, one last piece to it is underneath it, we measure how far you stretch. It's the percentage underneath the graph in the middle. None of you knows what your number means yet because it is not zero to 100. But I want to say a couple quick things about it. We wake up here, we stretch some degree, and we show up and do whatever it is that we do as long as we can stay there, maintain, but all day long we slide back, right? We recharge our batteries, we go there again. We slide back, recharge, up we go. Some of you think if you could do the evaluator again as if you were at home, it would be different, but it's not. We've, I've, I've literally had hundreds of people personally that I've worked with that said, I have to take it again, I know I will be different. They're not, okay? Because psychologically, wherever you go, there you are. What changes is that state of mind that you have. You're here for work most of the time, and I know what you all do. You're going to drive home tonight after a late day and go, ah, get, get to go home and be myself. That's less conscious behavior. All you're doing is allowing yourself to slide to the right-hand graph. Okay, but if you get home and somebody says, hey, honey, dinner was ready 45 minutes ago. You didn't tell me about your meeting. Where were you? You know what some of you are going to do? You're going to jump to your game face and start to maneuver like you would do in a corporate workplace, conscious persona, right there at work in the kitchen, making up an excuse about why you forgot to tell somebody you were going to be late. Whether it's work or home, we slide back and forth between the two states of mind. The key is to know how far you stretch. The range that, that, ant, that the percentage can be is negative 66.7 to positive 66.7. So some of you at 60 or 65 just went, whoa, I'm stretching pretty far. And the answer is yes, you are. But that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. If you're stretching to a place at 66.7% and you're delivering value and you're constructive and you're doing well at your job and you're not overly tired as a result, it's okay to do that.
But if you're at 20, 30, 40, 50, stretching or spiking a color energy, and you're really spent at the end of the day, or you're really wired on a Sunday night, you should evaluate, do you need to keep doing that? Ideally, you bring the right hand graph to work and you spike the color energy of the person you're talking to. That's what gives it power, okay? That's what makes it powerful. What I wanna do, I'll come back to that. What I wanna do is relate this to how individuals leading with these color energies might relate to change. Think about which color energy you're leading with and think about does this relate to you if you lead with cool blue? You need to be convinced. It's gotta make sense. You're looking for the logic. Imagine working with someone like this and you lead with sunshine yellow energy. What do you try to do frequently? You try and make them feel okay about it by talking a lot about emotions. Do you realize what a train wreck that is, right? And it's you fixing it the way you wish somebody would fix it for you. And that's the mistake we all make. We deliver to others what we wish they would deliver to us. That's how system one operates. System two says, I have an awareness that you need with cool blue. I know you're gonna take time. I know you need time to soak in what we're talking about tonight before you would even begin to say, this is good or this is bad. You don't get to that final conclusion until you've really done your work and thought it through. So think about the people that you work with. What energies do they lead with? That little card I gave you, that's a brilliant tool to show people. Take them to insights.com and say, click on this free one for you know, a couple tries. Or just look at this card. Tell me what you lead with because I want to work more productively and more effectively with you. That's how we do it. Um, Earth Green open to change that's congruent with their own values. I won't read all these for you, but think about the power of somebody that's where, where the change is aligned with, for them, personal values, mission, vision. If it's not in alignment, no amount of logic will ever get them there. No amount of energy and fun will ever get them there. You need to go to where they are and meet them with the energy that they lead with. Sunshine Yellow, that's where that talk and that energy and that emotion does make a difference. They wanna be talked down the ladder, so to speak. They want to be talked through the change with energy, with enthusiasm. And again, I'll, I'll send you a copy of all the slides as well. The last one, Fiery Red, prefers to introduce change when in a position of control. My wife. Not surprisingly. Like, they like to drive. They like to drive and, and focus. On the outside of the, um, the wheel in your profile, by the way, are some labels that are symptomatic of typical behaviors that you might see from somebody whose wheel position falls there. That fiery red is director. They love organizing and directing the, themselves and the actions of others. So it's really hard to take them through a change initiative if you don't find ways that they can take a leading role in it as well. Do you see the dramatic difference between somebody who leads with fiery red and somebody who leads with earth green? It really is a powerful difference. Here's the model, the last graph in there that I'll explain to you. It's the model that precedes the graphs page. What you notice about it, while it looks complicated, is it's broken down in two ways. There's 24 spokes because there's 24 orders that your color, colors can come in. So pretty simply, the graphs, the, um, the, the spokes that are gray represent the creative types. So the ability for somebody to have high red and green or high blue and yellow. The spokes are gray because they represent someone's potential ability to show up across the wheel. But with 24 spokes, 24 color orders, the three rings represent color intensity. So let me show you, and by the way, some of you have two dots like this because you change somewhat more than the folks who have just one dot. You still have two that are on top of each other. You don't change as much when you move to consciousness. This represents the graph, the color orders of that dot. So that's called wheel position 26. Happens to be mine. Any other 26s in the room? Hey, what is it about 26s that hang out at stuff like this? It's because 26 is hanging out at stuff like this. Why? Energy, enthusiasm, connection to people. By the way, it helps us get stuff done. And we won't be called upon to do a ton of detail tonight either, so we're okay with it. Although you've got to run some stuff, so yeah. But that's a 26. I mean, you could just define a person that way. But what if somebody is way yellow more than the others? They're in the outer ring. Six. We'll position six up there. There's somebody with high yellow and these three are low. The middle ring is where 60% of you fall. That's people with two energies high and two energies low, right? We call them classic, 60% of people are here. This person has the same color order, but now they've got earth green above the midpoint. They're gonna, be, they're gonna show up more amiable, patient, and caring than I do, or you, or you, or you, or all you 26s, right? Just imagine if we had more earth green energy. We are who we are. In the moment, any one of us can stretch any one of these energies to be able to use them to show up better. But under stress, we almost all lose our ability to remember that this is the most important aspect of human communication. 
It's the most important aspect. And under stress, we just, we just fall off the radar. It's a great way to look at, at, in the collective, what does a company look like? What does a department look like? If you're merging two departments, what will that resulting leadership team look like? It's such a quick and powerful way to see the culture and who's there. All of our clients have three foot, four foot posters on the walls. They put faces on some of them. Some companies colorize the entire company org chart. First and second color energies, the box and the line around it. So the entire company knows the first and second color energy of every other employee. Anything you can do to bring this language of communication, this language of color, and keep it alive. As it relates to change management, I want to give you just one model. Um, and it's, it's our model, but it just aligns with the idea of organizational readiness. Where does that come from? Okay, and you'll see the consistency with the other models. What's the vision? Where are we going? What we would say to people is, use your yellow energy to help us create the vision. What could it look like? What might it look like? How great might it be? That's the starting point. And then as you can see, that's number one down in sunshine yellow. Jump up to cool blue. Organizational redesign, intellectually. What's the data? What's the logic? What are we gonna do? What's the plan? Where do you jump next? Organizational restructuring, action phase, redeployment, people, resources. Remember what it is? Fiery red, go mode. We've created a vision. We've got a plan, cool blue. Fiery red is let's start doing it, get in there, dive in, we're in go mode, and look where you wrap it up. Organizational renewal, individual team and organizational revitalization, the people element. Now that we charged ahead with fiery red, how's everybody doing? Let's just do a check. Is everybody okay? It keeps the energies in check. It keeps us in balance with both what we do well naturally, because we all fall somewhere in the model, but recognizing that how we connect with everybody else matters. So. It's the same model, shared vision, enrolling people, intellectual design, new process, dive in, take action, and hey, is everybody doing okay? Think about that in terms of the model. Also think about recognizing type, because you're going to go back with some wristbands, take the extras on the table if you'd like, but you're going to go back and work with teams who aren't designated this way. The best way of all is ask. Show them the card and ask what color they lead with. The second best way is for you to guess. Read the examples up here. Color energies show up in everything, 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 everybody does. Body language, crystal clear, actions, crystal clear. I had a large group of lawyers in Baltimore last week, 600 of them, and I get in at 11 o'clock and there's a guy in the elevator and they put colored dots on everybody's name tag, but they didn't tell him what they were. And I looked at it and I said, do you know what that dot means? And he goes, no, I don't. No, a bunch of, we all got dots. A bunch of us got these dots. I got a red dot. What's it mean? And I said, I'm going to tell you tomorrow at 1 o'clock. And I ding, floor 11, I get out. The guy puts his arm in, catches the door, and jumps out after me. He goes, come on, tell me right now. Tell me right now. I want to know. <laughs> and I go, I said, well, it, it represents extroverted thinking, which is a guy who jumps out of the elevator on my floor at 11 o'clock at night to ask me what it means. Fiery red. I said, now go back. I'll tell you more tomorrow. The point is, if you're looking for it, you're always going to see it. If you're looking for it, you're always going to see it. It's about paying attention to people and having a focus on how they're showing up. Think about you and how you react to change as a function of your color energies. Think about the people that you work with and how can you use this model to make better connections with them. You've got the tools you need right here. Just ask people. Now, if you lead with red and yellow, don't ask them and don't say, hey, I got a model of communication. Where, where are you in this model? You're, uh, you're blue, blue guy, right? You're blue guy, just tell me. Blue guy, right? Oh, you know you've done it. If you hand the card to somebody and you think they might leave with blue and green, give them the card and say, go back and, uh, with your desk, right? And there's a lot more detail on the back. When you figure out what your, your order of these colors are, bring it back to me and let's talk. You're, they're going to have this like incredible sigh of relief like you can't believe because you've been interrupting them for nine years. You just don't realize you're doing it. If you can heighten an awareness of this, in fact, the easiest way to do it is keep those wristbands on for a few days. Keep them on for a week or a month. Keep them on for a year. If you kept them on for a year, you would become one of the most brilliant, conscious communicators on the planet. There's a negative effect, a negative risk, I guess, and I'll be honest with you. Other people would think that you're charitable for the whole year. <laughs> Give it a minute. Is it really a bad thing? Right? If you don't want to do that, come up with a way to like print your um, pro. You'll, by the way, you'll all get an electronic copy of your profile. Print the graphs page. Put it right next to the sink when you're brushing your teeth. Do a little check-in with yourself. How am I wired today? Am I, am I amping myself up? Oh my gosh. 
I don't have to amp up to brush my teeth. I don't have to amp up to drive to work. I'll amp up by, based on the first person I meet and interact with. That's where the system becomes powerful. You're gonna find out you could have so much more energy doing the work that you do. You can have such more effective communications if you simply notice the otherness of the other and put them in the context of a model of personality that you can use and you've now got all the tools you need to do it. The last sheet in front of you is just a one pager that describes the workshops and the programs and the models that we deliver. If you have any questions about anything I've talked about and I will forward my slides to someone in the group. Yep, to um, uh, Sherry. And also, uh, by the way, sorry, I didn't say thank you for bringing me here and Nancy for kind of jumping up after the moment in a previous training session to say, I've got a group I think this would be a good fit for. So hopefully you see how it's a fit in the work that you do and how helping understand and work with people and communicate better will make you a better change manager and also help them work through that change more effectively. Thanks.